So the last few lectures, we've gone back and forth a little bit. We've looked in some cases at kind of nuts and bolts issues with how new technologies change the way designers think or how new design needs inflect uh, the, the, the development of new technology. And at the same time, we've occasionally now stepped back and looked at the way that what we might call design culture has looked at these, uh, these new technologies. And today I want to do that very explicitly by looking at two movements in both art and uh, architecture that took on the idea of new technology, industrialized technology, mass-produced technology, and in ways that sh will probably resonate with the discussion we had about 19th century reactions to industrialization and the, the avant-garde um, with the arts and crafts movement uh, that, that look at how uh, uh, kind of both on, on one level a sort of rear guard, a sort of uh, hold off, what are we doing here, a reaction took hold, uh, and how at the same time there were other thoughts about uh, sort of celebrating the, the, the possibilities of, of, uh, of these new technologies that had come online. And we'll look as ever at, uh, at uh, designers, builders, movements also that synthesized uh, the two. Um, after World War II, uh, there are these kind of two very, very compelling but almost diametrically opposed uh, ways that, that, uh, that, that, that culture and the fine arts and architecture in particular develop. On the one hand, there's an incredible amount of optimism. There is all of this new technology, new industrial capacity, unprecedented economic growth, uh, especially in the United States, reconstruction in Europe that goes probably better than, uh, than, than people expect. And so the idea that engineering has not only brought about the end of the war, albeit in ways that uh, had, had dire consequences, but also that, that technology was playing a big role in sort of rebuilding after the war, uh, meant that there was a, a, a sort of incredible optimism uh, that, that, that began to take hold in, in the 1950s. Those consequences, though, the, the scale of uh, the human cost in both Europe and, and Japan, the, 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 the kind of really dissentering effects of seeing what uh, the first atomic bombs had done, uh, left, of course, a, a kind of sense of horror also that the technology was certainly solving problems, but the technology had maybe caused a lot of those problems uh, in the first place. There are some very practical consequences. Uh, the reconstruction in Europe in particular means that a lot of housing has to be built very, very quickly. New towns, new bridges, new roads have to be uh, built or uh, old ones have to be replaced after they've been bombed out. And so designers, builders, engineers come to rely on these new techniques for their speed and for their, their relatively low cost, concrete uh, in, in particular. At the same time, though, there's this idea that we that if... Um, if World War II has been such a kind of dividing line, right? We can't go back necessarily and, and build the way that we had. A lot of the, the, the representation that, uh, come, that had come about in architectures didn't seem valid uh, anymore. Old languages uh, felt out of date. So there are these new questions about what comes to be called monumentality. There are symposiums and whole journal uh, issues devoted to this idea that um, the, the old ways of building are kind of in the past. But those old ways had very effectively created monuments for society in Europe and America and, and, and much of the rest of the world as well. So how do we take the new technology, the new need for, for much larger functional areas, different functional capacities in some cases, uh, and how do those get molded into to buildings, constructions uh, that meet the, the ongoing kind of civic and cultural needs uh, of, of cities in particular? Some of these uh, questions may sound familiar, right? This is a sort of existential crisis, right? How do we build authentically if we have mass production uh, in, inflecting our, our technologies and, and the, the ways that, that we construct? Um, how do we make them meaningful? If How do we avoid uh, turning building just into a, a strict a commodity? How do we make sure that uh, it still has these kind of cultural values that, that we care about? And we see a, sort of a handful of responses. In some cases, there is a celebration of the science, right? That's going to be the new kind of language uh, of, of architecture and building. We do see a reaction. The postmodernist movement of the 70s and 80s certainly springs out of this idea that, well, none of this is valid and, and we have to go back to at least the, the old ways of, 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 of having buildings look like 
uh, their, their monuments. Um, and a, a third, grounding in materials, right? Sort of finding meaning in the, in the details and the, the kind of uh, textures and, and grains uh, of the materials that we build with would maybe a sort of ontological uh, approach. Tradition, at least in the 50s and 60s, or early 60s, was clearly not going to be the first move, uh, though, as we'll see, um, th there are ideas about the, the kind of honesty of materials that, that strike a chord maybe with some of the older ways of thinking, um, and uh, a sort of lingering sense that if, if, we have, if we throw out the kind of classical language that was so pervasive in the 20s and 30s, in the United States especially, uh, that at least the geometry there, the sort of big, big moves uh, of, of classicism might be, might be still valid. So with all that said, we, let's look at these two movements, uh, brutalism on the one hand, precisionism on the other, and see how they both proposed coping with the kind of radical changes that came about uh, after World War II. We'll start with brutalism, uh, a word that uh, has gained a lot of favor. Uh, again, today, brutalist architecture has this kind of weird uh, Instagram popularity all of a sudden. Um, it's a term that uh, is, is a little bit unfortunate because of its connotations, uh, and where it comes from isn't actually maybe where it might sound like it comes from, right? It sounds like it's a very sort of aggressive stance, and in some ways, uh, it, it, it began there. But there is, I think, also a sort of profound uh, humanist uh, effort at, at, uh, in, in the, the art and the architecture of brutalism as well. Where the term comes from is this phrase, art brut, that uh, was popular in France in the late 40s, early 1950s. Uh, art that was designed to sort of confront people with the reality of, of what had just happened in World War II. Um, and so you see these kind of very crudely made sculptures or the, the Dubuffet painting on the right, crudely painted uh, paintings that are designed to sort of celebrate the rawness, the, the, the crudity, the, the, the sort of torn downness uh, of, of the world uh, around them. This coincides with Corbusier's late career when he is using concrete in very kind of sculptural, almost kind of voluptuous ways, and he's choosing to let the concrete speak for itself. The, the kind of raw surfaces that you get when you strip the formwork are for Corbusier a, a valid way of expressing the, the building. Almost by coincidence, the, the French term for uh, this as struck concrete is béton brut, uh, which basically means like the raw timber. Uh, and as you can see in these Corbusier buildings, you see very clearly the imprint of the timber formwork uh, on the concrete. Béton brut and art brut get kind of uh, mashed together and we get this sort of nebulous term brutalism that comes to mean for many that, that raw concrete in its purest form, it's about raw concrete. Um, but we see it also kind of spreading throughout Europe and manifesting in, in different ways. And so Corbusier comes to be seen certainly as a, a, a leading figure in whatever brutalism is, a very frank expression of the raw materials, the raw concrete, or in the unité, as you see on the left, his famous housing block in Marseille, the, the frank admission that this is just hundreds of similar housing units lined up and, and trying to find architectural expression and meaning in that. But it also shows up in, uh, in England in what initially gets called by Rainer Banham the new empiricism, which I think might be a, a, a better a term for the movement, um, but a, a similar sense that in, in this case, uh, two architects, Allison and Peter Smithson, designing buildings where they're taking the industrial products uh, basically out of the factory uh, and just, just showing them off as they are, right? Letting the industrial production of building components sort of speak for itself. And on the far right, I think you could even apply this to a lot of the work of Mies van der Rohe, especially uh, his buildings at IIT, where the brick and the steel and the sort of patent glazing uh, that, that, that come right from the shop are all assembled very carefully, uh, but they are allowed to kind of speak for themselves, right? just to speak plainly. Um, Bannum writes extensively about the Smithsons, and, and he says that, um, uh, quote, uh, the work is characterized by an abstemious underdesigning of the details, letting things be just kind of as they are. Much of the impact of the building, he says, comes from the ineloquence but absolute consistency of such components as stairs and handrails. In other words, as he'll put it, there's a, a kind of quote-unquote bloody-mindedness, right, that, that we are going to literally 
take, as you see in the, the, the photo in the center on the top, we're going to take sinks directly off the factory floor. We're going to plug them right into pipes that we're going to show off. You're going to see not only how the building works, but you're going to see all of the nuts and bolts, right? There's, there's no quote unquote detailing uh, in the building according to Bantam, although as you can see, there are some, some choices made about uh, what gets expressed and what doesn't. Instead, the kind of raw industrial nature uh, of this building in particular, Hunstanton School, is going to just speak for itself, right? The architecture is going to sort of disappear into this collage of, of industrial uh, ready-mades. Um, and Bannum, in, in writing uh, about the book, um, sees, or writing about the school, sees it really as a, a fundamental break and a, a kind of new way forward. Um, he says it's uh, almost unique among modern buildings in being made of what it appears to be made of, right? Whatever's been said about the honest use of materials, usually, even in the case of Mies, uh, they, they, a lot of the details get fared out with like plaster or gla glazing details or something, even when they're made of concrete and steel. And Hunstanton says, he says, is showing you exactly what it's made of. Uh, you see where the water comes in and pipes. You see the electrical conduits sort of stapled to the, to the ceilings. Um, and the, uh, in, in doing that, you get this kind of very direct relationship, right? Which is something that um, plays with both the, the idea of a new empiricism, right? You collect the facts, you put them together, and they kind of are what they are. Uh, and also this idea of brutalism, of confronting you, right, with the, the, the kind of raw nature of, of, of building uh, in, the, in, in the era. And Bannum, interestingly, uh, says that he sort of puts this recipe together uh, for what he sees as brutalism or new empiricism. Interestingly, the formal legibility of the plan comes first, and I think you could argue that that's actually a kind of classical holdover, right? A lot of these buildings, Hunstanson uh, included, has this kind of latent uh, classical uh, order to it. Um, and then a clear exhibition of structure. You see the structural grid, you see the columns, you see the girders, and a valuation of materials for their inherent qualities as found, right? As struck concrete, um, steel that comes right off the rolling mill and is bolted together in ways that maybe strike us as crude, but also maybe tell us something about the, the assembly process. And Bannum goes on to list uh, a, a number of buildings that uh, he thinks are, are quote-unquote brutalist, but he acknowledges that this is kind of a fuzzy term and, and you could sort of apply it to whatever, uh, whatever you wanted. And he says really the, 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 the characteristic that links all of these buildings together is this bloody-mindedness, right? Um, the, that you are uh, going to insist on uh, people seeing what, what the building is actually made of, right? Sort of in-your-face uh, materials in your face, ready-made uh, fixtures and things like that. And these uh, French uh, phrases that he use, um, uses, if uh, for all these structures exhibit an excess of this is gently in manner. So from a distance, they appear to be very calm, very ordered, um, uh, but strong indeed, right? In other words, as they're actually made, when you get up close and look at what they're made of, um, there's a, a, a kind of strength to them, a, a bloody-mindedness again. And new brutalism, uh, as it's uh, called in England, comes to characterize a lot of the post-war housing that goes up. And, and for better or for worse, a lot of this is done in concrete. And brutalism, with its kind of ethic of raw expression, um, is very convenient if you're trying to build a lot of housing very, very cheaply. Uh, and so that raw concrete, uh, in some cases, is expressive and textural and, and seems to be engaging. In others, just seems really kind of cheap. Um, and in fact, the probably the most notorious of the, of the brutalist uh, housing projects, the Smithsons do uh, this complex, Robin Hood Gardens, uh, in, a, in, in a Sheffield. And as you can see, there is a relentlessness to it, for sure. Um, whether that relentlessness is uh, a kind of appreciated as an honest expression of the case, uh, or whether when you live with it every day, it becomes something that is just relentless and overbearing is a, is a fine line that, uh, that, that brutalism ends up having to, having to walk. There are other kind of much more uh, scaled down, much, I think, more soulful uh, exercises in this sort of confrontation with the like raw facts of construction. Um, this is maybe one of the most successful ones. This is an orphanage in Amsterdam uh, by the Dutch architect Otto van Eyck. And you can see that uh, Van Eyck is playing with 
in some cases, some vaguely classical language, right? There are ordering systems here that would seem um, lately familiar anyway to, to, to a good classicist of the 20s or 30s. Um, but what Van Eyck has done is he's stripped all of the ornament and he's again let the, the materials, in this case a lot of concrete, uh, speak for itself. Now, you can take Banham's argument about Hunstenson and say, oh, well, there's no detailing here. And in fact, Van Eyck has detailed this very, very carefully, right? It is, it is concrete that is raw and as struck, but as you can see, it's very consistent. Uh, the, 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 the lines of it are very precise. Um, and he's basically putting the best possible face uh, on, on raw concrete and then letting the materials speak for themselves. And this is, I think, a great example of, of this idea that um, in, in brutalism that you're aspiring to the kind of classical order, even if it's very, very latent in this case, um, but you're doing it with a palette of materials that speaks to the, the age, right? That speaks to the, the, the things that we use to build with, in this case, in, in 1960. So that confrontation, that rawness, um, that kind of in-your-face uh, uh, attitude that, that we associate with brutalism is matched, and I think in some cases kind of um, countered by uh, another strain. And this also borrows uh, from a from an art movement. Uh, precisionism was a was a painting movement. Charles Sheeler and Edward Hopper were often called uh, precisionists. The architectural historian Vincent Scully in 1960. Uh, proposed that this was also almost kind of a secret uh, architectural style uh, that had grown up in particular uh, in the United States. And he goes back all the way to uh, kind of colonial uh, dwellings when he, when he tries to explain what precisionism is and why it's so uh, sort of particular or so appropriate uh, to, to North America. He says that the, the prototypical uh, American house on the prairie uh, rides the land like a ship separate from it. Um, and he talks about how it, it is all composed of thin planes, right? Thin surfaces and very, very uh, taut kind of precise detailing uh, at the corners. Um, the hearth, he says, is the only thing that connects the house to the ground. Everything else uh, is basically sort of almost denying the, the, the mass uh, of a house that the brutalist would have said was uh, maybe more uh, more appropriate or more honest. And there is, as in brutalism, a, a little bit of alienation here. Scully says that um, there's a, a, a kind of almost fear of the landscape. And so building up and building tightly, building precise as a way of sort of setting yourself uh, against the land. And he says also that there's very definitely what he calls a Puritan sublimation, right? And this goes all the way back to old uh, Puritan or, uh, or, or, or Protestant churches where they stripped all of the ornament out because that had come to be seen uh, as a symbol of decadence, right? Catholic decadence uh, in, in particular. Um, the, and the, the idea that um, you can kind of uh, confront nature, but also sort of overcome it, right? That we have ways of building that are very human. And that, that humanness comes not from the kind of rawness, but being able to essentially cook the materials, right? To turn them into something uh, that is uh, precise, that is um, you know, carefully ordered, uh, and that is presented in ways that are uh, geared more toward our visual sensibility than our uh, desire for any sort of honesty uh, in, in building. And so here, just to see what Scully is talking about on the left, uh, Charles Sheeler, uh, a landscape that um, involves prototypical American buildings, right? Factories, grain elevators, railroads. And in this, you can see that all of the lines are, again, very precise. The planes are all kind of very carefully curated. There's not a speck of dirt or dust uh, where, where it's not supposed to be. Um, everything is very clean, controlled, contained, precise. And Scully compares this, for example, to uh, a shaker barn on the right, one of these big round barns where um, the, the mass is very simple and the detailing, as you can see, is really, really tailored, right? Very, very tightly laid uh, stonework, very precise sort of um, uh, openings in the stonework for the windows. And he says this sense of kind of trying to overcome uh, nature or overcome the rawness of materials, uh, he says, is also a legitimate response, right? One that celebrates the, the technology uh, more than confronts us with it.
And he also points to more contemporary examples. And this, I think, is where you see the real contrast maybe with, with brutalism. He talks about Philip Johnson's glass house as being uh, you know, almost a paradigm case of precisionist architecture. Um, it is set on this pristine grass plain that is manicured, sculpted, you know, paved almost completely flat. Um, and, and it sits there with these giant planes of glass uh, in a way that really puts the emphasis on the corners, and in this case, on the very tight steel detailing, almost the opposite of, of Hunstanton School. Three years later, Mies van der Rohe does his own version of that uh, for a, a Chicago doctor named Edith Farnsworth. And here, I think, if, you, if, if there's like one uh, building that really reflects this idea that um, the, 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 the precision of detailing, the precision of ordering, uh, faring out any sense of the, of the rawness at all, but looking at everything as polished and honed, um, that, that this is you know, maybe a, a kind of um, nervous reaction to the, the way that technology is developed, but a legitimate one. And, and the Farnsworth House to me is just as, um, just as appropriate a statement to, uh, or a reaction to what's going on in the cultural world and the political world and the technological world uh, as the, the more sort of in-your-face uh, uh, aspects of, of, of brutalism, right? Two sort of opposite ways of thinking about it, uh, but both, I think, coping with uh, the, the, the same kind of dislocation that comes from uh, going through a, a, a major world war. And here, just for comparison, this is Mies on the left uh, and Johnson on the right. Johnson's is much more, um, I would say, prototypically classicist, right? Even though uh, there are some asymmetries to it, you can see that the box has a very, very uh, simple, very, very carefully laid out uh, classical grid, right? Tripartite uh, it could be a, a, a building by uh, Schinkel when you look at the plan, if you just ignore the fact that it's thin glass walls instead of thick uh, masonry walls. And on the left, uh, the, the Farnsworth House, actually has the same structural grid, but you can see that Mies is playing uh, around a little bit more with it and putting the emphasis not on the, the re-entering corners of the steel columns, but instead on, the, on the, the glazing, right? Making the building literally float above the ground uh, and, and giving our eyes these incredibly tight uh, lines to look at as, as the kind of delineation of the, of the box. Okay, in the second part, we'll look at a kind of synthesis. What happens when you uh, agree both with the kind of celebration of raw materials, the confrontational nature uh, of brutalism, trying to explain you know, just how kind of rough and raw uh, building is, even in a technological world, and you still have this idea that, that we have to take those raw materials and kind of cook with them and, and make something uh, that is a little bit more elegant, uh, a little bit more precise.